um, my name is Mariko. This is my Twitter handle. Um, I just tweeted the link to this slide, so if you want to have it on your laptop, you can check that out. I'm a software engineer of JavaScript kind, and I organize a meetup called Brooklyn JS in Brooklyn, month three. So this is my day job. I make a text editor which was used by TV industry, which so for some reason, TV industry still has this need of printing out on paper. So I deal with a lot of bug about printing issues, and I hate print CSS. Uh, on my side, I'm also interested in like punch card, an early form of computer. So this is the video of me making my own 8-bit computer to uh, data fit it by punch card and then creating a textile that get fitted into 80s computer code knitting machine. Anyway, um, so those two interests, so like, it's not only textile, I'm really interested in like early mechanical computing, and that led me into typesetting machine. I was thinking a lot about printing, and I was thinking a lot about early computer, and that led me to a thing called typesetting. Now, prior to this, and warning, this is like total like countless nights of just Googling stuff, but um, before doing this, in my mind, if I hear a letterpress or typesetting, I thought of things like this, like hip print shop where you order your wedding invitation from, or the Gutenberg Bible, where <laughs> you know the types are hand picked and put it into flame one by one. And you know, this was the way to print something on paper for a long time. But I deal with this now. You know, we have this like click of a button, magically, beautifully formatted type comes out of the printer. So I was interested in what happens in between from here to there, especially the time when machine, started, machine and computers started to influence our workflow, which led me to this machine called Linotype. The why and how this was all indeed is quite interesting. I don't have time to fit into 10 minutes. I'm really sad. But in conclusion, this machine called Linotype was invented by German immigrant Otmar Mergenthaler in 1886. And it is a way to help type hand by hand typesetting into semi automated. So it has special keyboard, it's not quirky. It, uh, the capital letter is on one side, and then lowercase letter in the, on the other side. And then on top of this machine has thing called magazine that contains a mold for type, metal mold for type. So when you type on the keyboard, those molds fall down and creating a line of a set of mold, which now then gets sent into molding section where hot molten metal shoots off and create a slab of type. And the machine creates a line of type, so it's called linotype. It doesn't end here, it's quite interesting. After this um, type is made, the mold doesn't needs to be redistributed back into a magazine again, so this giant robot arm comes down grabs those metal molds, and then put it into a, a part of a machine called redistribution, where it kind of works like a key on your door, and each metal mold put it back into each hole of the magazine. So it's quite fascinating. This was very revolutionary invention. The type industry and print industry used this this exact machine for almost 100 years. So I mentioned this was invented in 1886. For example, New York Times, up until eight, 1978, they used linotype to typeset their issue. So the last issue of New York Times that was hot metal typeset was July 2nd. So it was technically, I guess, done in July 1st um, of 1978. But you know, this was taken by thin code computer, and I actually <laughs> took this from uh, archival footage of a typographic union explaining the new technology that's coming, and this particular section is explaining, you know, you may think this computer thing that green monster eating paper uh, tape inside a black box, it's actually a clear box with set of logic. <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting film to watch, too. Um, so I mentioned that the computer was introduced to the workflow of typesetting, but it was used for input. So instead of typing directly into typesetter, computer and memory and punch card tape was used, but typesetter was still a separate thing. But it was new typesetter. It did not use metal type anymore. It is called photo typesetting. The metal type mold was replaced with a film with font face on it. And the machine contained the 
bends so that it can enlarge. So you don't have to buy multiple size of metal typeset to set a various size of type. So basically the machine photographs each letter and exposes it into contact paper, then develops it and spits out what's called cold type as opposed to hot metal type. Then this cold type is sent into layer division and they cut and paste, literally, and they draw a line, literally, um, create a page. So this was, ladies and gentlemen, this was a WYSIWYG editor of um, 70s. <laughs> So, <laughs> workplace started looking like this, you know, a bunch of computers under fluorescent light. And industry started to develop language and specification to typeset. So, things like how to set a typeset, and here's the documentation of mock -up, markup for setting a typeface and the font size. And this is how uh, the training guide of how you would use those markup. And this is, you know, you can think of it as like uh, opening up dev tool and seeing a CSS for the each DOM element, but in paper. Um, so this was quite exciting, right? And what's more exciting as a computer programmer is, us, is that Bell Lab bought this photo type setter and used Unix to typeset on this machine. So the particular machine Bell Lab bought was by Graphics Systems from Massachusetts, and the model could computer-assisted typesetter. Uh, this computer-assisted typesetter, even though it's this computer, it's not quite like directly coded into it. It was still needed to use the film font, it was photo typesetter, but in addition to feeding the data from paper type, a paper tape, you could have hook on a computer like PDP-11, to directly communicate with typesetter. And from yesterday, we all know that the hidden reason that PDP-11 was bought in the Bell Lab was that Ken Thompson wanted to play the video game. And some of you laughed at the fact that, you know, the Bell Lab authorized this, you know, quarter million, well, half million dollar in current, um, current currency uh, expensive computer for just because they wanted to typeset a pattern, but to me, it makes total logical sense. So I couldn't find a actual um, CAT typesetter, so this is just a book that Bell Lab published about document formatting and typesetting in Unix. But the Bell Lab's core um, interest was to research, and as a research facility, they needed to publish research papers, and they need to patent those findings as a patent application. Now, as I mentioned, Printing out, the idea of printing out something from printer was still novel thing. So if you wanted to send it to typesetter for proper typesetted paper, you would spend like $2 a page to typeset it. So trying to do that in-house on the language and system that they developed in-house totally makes sense. On top of that, the programming language community was quite excited about this new and exciting idea of using computer to format document. This, the word processing was literally the exciting field to explore in late 60s and early 70s. So things like Lanoff was developed for the Multix machine in um, MIT, and then gets uh, imported into Unix called Lof at Bell Lab. But these systems are made for computers, right? So you could probably hook into dot matrix printer to get an outcome out of it, but it was not specified for typesetting machine. And at Bell Lab, they ported the LOF into specifically for typesetting machine called TLOF, and T stands for typesetter. And I think yesterday's talk mentioned a little bit about that. So now that they have this foundation of document typesetting specifically for typesetter, they created a few domain-specific preprocessor like Tubble to create a table, and this is a sample output and the code and then something like EQN, which was used to typeset a math equations. Um, the key person who worked on the Bell Lab is Brian Carnegie, who is known for the co-author of Programming Language Awk, but Brian was already interested in document um, system prior joining the Bell Lab. He spent a time at MIT, and he was introduced to this idea of using computer to format document. So, 
the better part of 70s, he spent a lot of time on typesetting technologies, creating languages like EQN, and later created a preprocessor called PIC, which was able to typeset a drawing. So, the phototype setter was purchased in 72, and they used it until 78. So after seven to eight years, it was time for upgrade, and Brian Carnegie led the team to find new typesetting machine, because new technology was being introduced called a cathode ray tube. Looks like this. So what was awesome is that with cathode ray tube, you can completely replace film font, and you can draw anything you want and directly um, photograph what was drawn on the CRT monitor or CRT to uh, contact paper. So that meant that you can create your own font and you can create emoji. So, you know, this is the, what, what was shown on the machine, on the cathode ray tube machine. But, so, the Brian Cunningham's team decided to purchase this machine called Linotron 202, which ironically was the manufacturer who, which used to make a linotype machine, then evolved into creating a phototype setter. Um, the machine came with a piece of software the linotype made, and to a court, Brian Cunningham, it was completely unusable. So they were like, what do we do? We have this machine, and it prints beautiful because you know, it was made by print manufacturer, but the software is shit. At the time in Bell Lab, though, luckily, Ken Thompson and Joe Condon just wrapped up a project for Bell Chess Machine, and they were interested in publishing a book about chess with proper chess font, or I would like to say chess emoji. Um, and also, they were hardware people who understood how computing hardware worked. So three of them got together, reverse engineered what was in the Linotron 202, and created an internal memo of what they thought Linotron was doing. And here you can see, oh, where did it go? There it go. Here you can see that they're describing what they think how Linotron is drawing a font. And then here is a chess font that they created with Linotron 202 after they reverse engineered it. But the coolest part of this paper is on top page. So the title of this memo is called Experience with Malgamthala Linotron 202 Phototype Setter or How We Spend Our Summer Vacation. <laughs> <laughs> because they did it over uh, while Bella was on the summer vacation period. So this was a short history and the clamped together history of how Typesetter came in play with our environment computer. So hopefully you now have answered to things like, why is largest font size in major software always 72 point? Well, the font, the metal font that used to be made, the largest size was 72 point. And a point doesn't make sense when you design on the web or the digital screen, but that was metrics that, that was used for actual physical paper. And when you think about something boring, old type, like New, New uh, Times New Roman or Helvetica, you can now think about it like once some, somebody hand curved that type, and that type survived several generations of technological advance. So just like Jacquard Loon became an early version of computer, what's on the computer also has a history tied into um, some time before computer. So hopefully, next time you sit in front of computer screen or next time you click on the print button. Uh, this talk may remind you of the artists and craftsmen who created and who worked on those things so that we can have nice things here. Thank you. Thank you.